Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank each of you who have given financially to our parish during this shutdown. Your financial support allows us to continue to pay our employees, maintain our buildings, and also to continue to serve you in this digital format. For those who have not yet given, there are three ways you can give at this time. The first is you can sign up for electronic giving by going to faith.direct backslash IN872. Register an account and begin giving electronically. You can also download their app for your smartphone and set your account up easily that way. You can now also text to give using a credit card. Text the dollar amount you wish to give to 812-296-4080. It will send a message to your phone. You can follow the prompts and make your contribution that way. Once you are set up with the text to give, you simply need to text an amount to that number and then it will text you back and ask you which fund you want it to go to. You punch in the number of the fund and that's it. It's really very easy. Finally, you can mail in your offering. You can do that best by check. Sending cash in the mail is dangerous and we do not recommend it. Thanks again to all of you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Catholic community of St. John Paul II. A special welcome to all who are visiting with us today. Today we celebrate the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time. All the words for the music today will be up on the screen. Please stand and together we'll sing our gathering song, Gather Us In. Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thank you. And I welcome all of you to the celebration of the Eucharist today, extending a special welcome to any visitors who might be with us. We welcome you, and we're honored that you've chosen to worship with us. Also, welcome to all those who are watching our live stream at home. Uh, we welcome you, and we're looking forward to the day when you can join us uh, back here in church. And so, uh, for our prayer partners today, I'm going to invite you to pray for somebody who maybe is experiencing some financial difficulties, uh, maybe because of coronavirus, maybe even before that, uh, but somebody who you know who's experiencing some financial difficulties as we talk about financial contentment today uh, in my homily. So uh, let's uh, call one of those people to mind and pray for them throughout this liturgy. So as we gather together, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. Lord Jesus, you are to know the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners to repentance. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge. You shall return it to him before sunset. 
for this cloak of his is the only covering he has for his body. Who else has he to sleep? What else has he to sleep in? If he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. The word of the Lord. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, you know what sort of people we were among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model for all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. 
For they themselves openly declared about us what sort of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wave his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. The word of the Lord. Church more money. 
Uh, I don't think that's the case, actually, at least not for me. But for me, to, the reason that I find this the most difficult one to give is that the scriptures give us so much information and advice about money and finances and material possessions <laughs> that it's hard to boil it down into a 15-minute homily. In fact, just a couple of months ago, I did a four-part series on the biblical principles of money, uh, each one of those being an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and so even with that, I had to pare that down and, and cut out some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about there. And so today I'm going to try to do it in 15 minutes. But I want to start off with a little quiz. I've got six quotes here. Three are from the Bible and three are not. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Money is the root of all evil. God's blessings are given to those who give. If you co-sign for another, you're stupid. <laughs> Riches and property are a gift from God. Saving your money will prove that you are a child of the Father. Three of those come from Scripture and three don't. Give me the numbers of the three you think come from Scripture. Just somebody yell out three numbers that you think come from the Scriptures. One, three, and five? That's not right. So you thank you for playing. Two, three, and five. That's not right, but thank you for the playing. One, four, and six. One, four, and six is close, but that's not right either. One, four, and six have two of the three. One, five, and four. I think I've heard it over there someplace. Yeah, one, five, and four. Uh, those three uh, are uh, from the scriptures. Uh, number one, the rich rule over the poor and borrow with slaves to the lenders is Proverbs 22, 7. Money is the root of all evil. That's really a trick question. All right? Uh, because 1 Timothy 6, uh, verse 10 says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Number three, God's blessings are given to those uh, who give. I simply made that one up. But I think there's some truth in it. Number four is from the Bible. If you co-sign for another, you're stupid. Uh, that is uh, Proverbs 17, uh, verse 18. That's the contemporary English version. The New American Bible version that we read here at church says this. One who signs surety for another lacks sense. One who signs surety for another surety is a co-signing. One who signs surety for another lacks sense. Uh, then number number five, uh, riches and property are a gift from God is Ecclesiastes 5.18, and I'll be sharing on that a little bit later, and then the last one I made up as well. But I also think there's some truth in that one. So, did you know that the Bible has over 3,000, over 3,000 verses that deal with money, material possessions, wealth, and how to deal with them? Over 3,000. In fact, there is more written in the Bible about money and possessions and wealth and all that than any other single topic throughout the Bible. So what I want to do today is I want to look briefly at two biblical principles of money that if we get right, help us develop what I call spiritual maturity in terms of our finances. Uh, and that will lead us, I think, to the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. And then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a more practical framework, a brief framework that can help you whenever you have a decision to make that's a financial decision in one way or another. So first, the two biblical principles. The first one is this. Money is amoral, but it can be dangerous. Amoral means that money itself doesn't have any moral value. It's not anything that can be right or wrong, good or bad. Uh, money is simply green paper with pictures of dead presents on. I know the twenty dollar bill has Alexander Hamilton; he wasn't a president. I know that. Okay, uh, so so you know, but but it has pictures of that, and, and but it doesn't have any value in and of itself. Uh, what we do with it and how we handle it, though, can be dangerous. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says it. M m having money can lead to greed. Those who want to be rich are falling into a temptation for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's the most misquoted scripture, I think, because so many people say that money is the root of all evil, and that's not what the Bible says. It's when we become overly attached to money, that, that, that temptation. When we want money just for the sake of money, when we want to grow rich just for the sake of growing rich, that becomes a temptation. Because what happens is, number two, 
uh, if we have a power of money, if we have a good deal of wealth, that can lead us to think that we don't need God. That we don't need God. He who trusts in his riches will fail, will fall. But like green leaves, the just one flourishes. What this tells us is that as we gain wealth, and that is not anything wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with gaining wealth. But what you do is you have to look at that and say, as I gain wealth, I have more responsibilities to manage it according to the way God intends for me to manage it. Number three, money can make people dishonest. If you start worshiping money, you can become dishonest and get more of it. But if you work hard for the money you have, that's a good thing. It's a biblical mandate. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. But he who gathers by labor will increase. In other words, hard work is a biblical mandate. Those who gather by labor will increase. Hard work is praised throughout the scriptures, and the financial benefits of hard work should be seen as something good. Finally, like all aspects of our lives, we will be held accountable to God with what we do with our money. How hard we are working, how generous we are, how good stewards we are with what has been trusted to us to manage. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we will be held accountable. The Bible tells us each of us must give an account of himself to God. So that's the first biblical principle. Money itself is amoral. It's not good. It's not bad. But it can be, if we're not careful with it, it can be dangerous. The second biblical principle is this. God owns it all. We are simply the managers. Why do I say this? Once again, for the Bible tells me so. Do you get the idea that if you want to be spiritually mature when talking about money, if you want to be content when talking about money, it's going to have to come from learning what God says about money, what the Bible says about all this. And the Bible tells us that God owns it all. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all it holds. The world and all who live in it. The earth is the Lord's and all it holds uh, uh, of the world and all who live in it. Psalm 95 says, Whose hand holds the depths of the earth? Who owns the top of the mountain? The sea and the dry land belong to God who made them, who formed them by hand. And then Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, Think, think people, the heavens, even the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God as well as the earth and all that's in it. So God owns it all. And God chooses to share it with us. God chooses to share it. We call that being co-creators with God. And we're responsible to manage it well. Why? Because wealth is uncertain. We might have it at one time, and we might lose it at another time. But God is always certain. God is always there. Wealth might be undependable, but God is dependable. Wealth might be not trustworthy, while God is trustworthy. It's the parable of the talents. I want to go through uh, that. This will be our gospel reading about a month from now. But I want to read just the beginning of that parable to you. Jesus told his disciples this parable. A man going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one to each according to his ability, and then he went away. A talent was a unit of money, all right? When we hear this, we kind of think uh, of gifts and talents, things that we're good at, but it's not that. It's a unit of money. So the, the owner gives a, a large sum of money, it wasn't even a small sum, about $400,000 or so. What, what, what Jesus is saying is the owner gives the person all the money they need for a lifetime. He gives them a lifetime supply of money to manage while they're gone. Then the parable continues. Immediately, the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. And if you've been in church for a long time, you remember the accounting, you know the rest of the story. He holds them accountable. The one who was given five said, I made you another five. And he says, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The one who was given two made another two. He says, well done. Good job. The one who was given one becomes afraid of the master. And so he buries it. He hides it, but he gives it back to him. 
He gives it back to him. They don't lose any of it, but they don't make any more. And, and Jesus says the owner calls him a worthless servant. The worthless servant. And then he says this, take the one from him and, and give it to the one who has ten. When we manage God's money well, when we manage God's money according to biblical principles, God rewards us by giving us more to manage. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not some kind of prosperity gospel kind of preaching. It's simply uh, about, well, it's about this. If you have a job to do, and you, you work for an organization, you're a, a boss, a manager at work, and you need something done, are you going to go to the person who you know can do it, who you know is reliable, who know is trustworthy, who you know is, is going to do it and do it well according to what you need done, the way you need it done, or are you going to go to someone else? Well, God's the same way. If he sees somebody who's managing well what is already entrusted to him, just as in the parable of talents, he's going to give that person more to manage. You see, ultimately, there are only three things that we can do with money. We can save it, we can spend it, and we can give it. Those are really the only three things that we can do with money, and the Bible tells us we really should do all three of those things. We can save it. In the house of the wise are precious treasures, but a fool consumes everything he has. There's some wisdom in having a rainy day fund. That's what my grandma used to call it, having a rainy day fund. And people might say, well, Father Tom, you need to be more positive than that. I am positive that sometime in your life it's going to rain. All right? You need to have a rainy day fund for those times. If you spend everything you have, there's no wisdom in that. The second thing we can do with money is we can spend it, and we should spend it. Those to whom God gives riches and properties and, and grants power to partake of them so that they receive their lot and find joy from the fruits of their labor, this is a gift from God. To enjoy our money and, and what it can buy us is a gift from God. To use it well is a gift from God. God wants us to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Craig Rochelle who's the uh, pastor of a, a mega church, I think up in uh, the Chicago area, says, why is, it, why is it that the only blessing uh, from God that we apologize for is our wealth? Why is it that we feel like we have to apologize for that? And then the third thing we can do with money is we can give it. Each must do as already determined, without sadness or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I'm convinced that outrageous giving is the most fun you can ever have with money. So I've thrown a lot at you uh, today. I hit 14 of the 3,000 verses of the Bible that have to deal with money. But let me land this airplane. How can we find contentment in how we handle our finances? Here's a piece of, I hope, very practical advice. Whenever you have a fi financial decision to make, should I buy a new car or should I buy a used car? Uh, should I take this vacation uh, or not? Should I save this money I have or should I spend it on something? Whatever it is, ask yourself these three questions and it should give you some financial contentment uh, in your journey. Number one, what does the good book say? What does the Bible say about that? Once again, over 3,000 verses in the Bible, a few general themes. The Bible tells us to avoid debt, to live on less than you make, to enjoy life but make sure you don't spend everything you have, and to be outrageously generous. All those you can find in the Bible and so much more. I've studied this with some depth for about the last 20 years, and I think I've only scratched still just the surface of all that the Bible offers us. But what scriptures do for me is that they guide me in my decision making on my personal finance, and I might add on the financial decisions that I make for our parish as well. Number two, ask this question. What do I believe God would want me to do? With, with my money. In other words, take some time to pray about each financial decision that we have to make. And finally, when I begin to believe that I'm ready uh, to make a decision, ask yourself this question, does this decision give me peace? Does this decision give me peace? Do those three things. Find out what the scriptures say, pray about it, ask God what God would want you to do, and then wait till you have some sense of peace. If you do these three things with consistency over a long period of time, you will find contentment in your financial walk with God.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again, glory to judge, living in the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. With confidence, we place our prayers of petition now before our God. That our church may make known the love of Christ in its pastoral ministry to the most vulnerable of our world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our young people may celebrate the World Youth Day with a desire to listen more attentively to the Lord's voice in their lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who are oppressed may be treated with compassion. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all scholars, especially those who study law, may humbly acknowledge God as the source of all wisdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all gathered here around the table of the Lord may be knitted together as a dynamic community of faith and strengthened in keeping God's commandments. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Barbara and John Herbst and Adolph and Marion Wise, the intentions of this Mass. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all our prayer requests and for the intentions of our prayer partners at this Mass. Through the intercession of Mary, the Mother of God, St. John Paul II, and all the saints, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, hear the prayers we present to you this day. Grant that you find good in them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, 
For you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed us in your own image and set us over the whole world and all its wonders as stewards in your name over all you have made and to forever praise you in your mighty works through Jesus Christ who is our Lord. And so with all the angels and all the saints, we too praise you as in joyful celebration we have made.
As Jesus taught us, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins then, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Amen. Let's share with one another now a sign of Christ's peace. As we continue to hold our brothers and sisters who are not worshiping with us in our hearts, please join in our prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Take this bread. 
your sacraments, O Lord, we pray, perfect in us what lies within them, that what we now celebrate in science we may one day possess in truth. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I have a couple of announcements. One of them is a video uh, that we want to show for our upcoming Alpha series. Every day we are inundated with so much information, yet so many questions remain. How can I find my purpose? Why am I here? What should I believe? How can I find peace? Why is life so unfair? How can I thrive in challenging times? How can I make the most of my life? These are life's big questions, but there's rarely enough time to think them through properly. If you live to be 70, you're probably going to spend 20 years and 3 months asleep, 10 years and 5 months watching TV, 5 years and 9 months in some form of transportation, 7 years and 6 months eating and drinking. Why not spend less than 24 of them asking life's biggest questions and try Alpha? Let us sing together, Go Make a Difference. 